The year was 1519. According to history, at least according to historical tales, when the Spanish conquistador Cortez landed in, in what is known today as Mexico. You see, the, the Spanish conquistadors were in search for gold and silver and precious jewels. And the Aztecs, their civilization, they contained all of that that was renowned throughout the world. And so Cortez wanted to have some of that glory and he wanted to have some of that, that, uh, that wealth. And so the story is told, be it historically accurate or, or made up, either case, I'm going to use it today, is that when his, his soldiers, they, they got off of their boats, the history will record they had somewhere around 11 boats, somewhere around 16 horses amongst all 600 of his soldiers, that as the men would start their march inward of the Yucatan Peninsula, that Cortez would issue the command to burn the ships. Now you think about that from a standpoint of, of the psyche of a military mind that would, would burn the only means of escape for his people. He didn't know how, 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 how uh, victorious the, the Aztecs were going to be and could be. He had known that for 600 years uh, prior to his landing in the Yucatan Peninsula that conquistadors and other great conquerors had tried to come in and to overthrow this great civilization and only to have found that they have uh, failed. And so one has to ask the question, why would Cortez issue the command to burn the ships as his men marched inland? Well, Cortez wasn't the only one who did that. Alexander the Great, thousands of years before, a thousand years before Cortez would land at the Yucatan Peninsula, Cor uh, Alexander the Great is said to have landed in Persia in his great conquest of trying to, to, to conquer the world that he also issued the command to burn the ships as his men marched into Persia. Some people look at that and they would say, why would individuals, why would individuals get rid of their only source of retreat and I would simply offer this to you. Because when you get rid of your source of retreat, listen to me, somebody needs to listen to this today. When you get rid of your only source of retreat, your only options are to be victorious or die. There is no other option. There is no way out. And when you think about that spiritually speaking, I want to propose to you today that the whole concept of it's time for a fire is based upon this same idea that you and I as children of God, we must get rid of our retreat option. There are too many of us who decided to obey the gospel only to leave the back door open just in case it didn't work out. And we can't live that way anymore. That may be how you came through these doors today. But my desire is by the time you leave, that that door is closed and the fire has already consumed your way out. Now I want to show you something. You say, Joe, is that even biblical? It's biblical. Look in your Bibles at 1 Kings chapter 19. I want you to see this today as together we look at the call of the man by the name of Elisha. Now you know there are two individuals and sometimes we get those mixed up, right? There's Elijah and there's Elisha. Well, we're looking at Elisha. Elijah is the one that puts into practice. He, he puts his mantle over Elisha's shoulders, right? But it's Elisha that we're talking about this morning when it comes to the idea that it's time for God's people to burn the ships. Now, here's the deal. Elisha is, is out plowing his fields. You look at chapter 19 of 1 Kings. In verse 19, the Bible says this. So he, he being Elijah, Elijah just got called out of hiding in the caves because Jezebel was going to come and kill him. And he thought he was the only one left who had not bowed a knee to Baal. I find that quite interesting that that's on the tail end of dealing with the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel where God showed that he was more powerful than any overcoming force. And yet Elijah had forgotten that. So Elijah, he gets out of the cave. He gets out of his hiding. And what I love about God is God's going to take him home here. Now, God, God understands his people getting discouraged. He's, he's going to let you go through your discouragements in life because his job is not to rescue you from all your pain. His job is to rescue you from your sin. Sometimes we believe that God's going to take me out of my pain. God never promised that. As a matter of fact, he only called you to be faithful through your pain. 
We looked at that yesterday at the youth rally. There are many people who suffered, but God didn't rescue everybody from their suffering. But His goal is to rescue you from your sin. Verse 19, the Bible says this, So he, he being Elijah, departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, while he was plowing with twelve pairs of oxen before him, and he with the twelfth. And Elijah passed over to him and threw his mantle on him. Verse 20 reads this way, He left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Please let me kiss my father and my mother, then I will follow you. And he said to him, go back again, for what have I done to you? Now you may look at that and say, wait a second, there were other people that were called to follow Jesus, but they wanted to go back and to do something, and that was looked at as negative. In that context, it was. In this context, there's no inclination that I can read unless I read into the text that Elijah was displeased with Elisha. This is merely a situation where Elisha has to make a decision. God has, has placed upon Elijah to go put the mantle upon another to pass the torch. And so he has done that and Elisha says, let me go back and kiss my father and my mother. Elijah says, what have I done to you? Go back. So look at verse 21. The Bible reads this way. So he returned from following him and took the pair of oxen. Now mind yourself, he had 12. Took the pair of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the implements of the oxen, and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he arose and followed Elijah and ministered to him. I want you to think through this in a real manner with me. We know a few things about Elisha. Number one, we know this, that he's the son of Shaphat. We know this as well, that he had 12 pair of oxen. And that he was working with the twelfth pair. I can only imagine that he was controlling the front pair so that the others would follow along with him. I, I don't know. I, I've never plowed with oxen. My, my father you know, thought it was a great idea to have a two-acre garden once. And he plowed with a tiller. Uh, it was one that had a, a back tine so he didn't have to jump on it like a jackhammer. Right? But the idea was this. I've never plowed with oxen. So I'm only imagining that he's working with the front pair so the rest of them follow. He comes up and he says, you know what, let me go back and kiss my father and my mother. Elisha says, go back, what have I done to you? He goes back and the Bible says this, that he sacrificed his oxen. I want you to think about a farmer. I want you to think about the importance of the farmer's machinery. I've spoken in Missouri numerous times and I can tell you this, those farmers are pretty proud of their tractors. Those tractors today, they have air conditioning. Those tractors today, they have GPS. Those guys get out in the, in the rice fields and they push the coordinates in and I just envision them kicking back with their feet up, drinking some sweet tea, listening to some music. The tractor pretty much runs itself is what they'll tell me. But I know this much. Those rice farmers have no income if they get rid of their tractors. They have no source of income. They have no source of revenue. They have no way to feed their families. Those tractors are important to their line of work. So I want you to think about this. A farmer that you know, he just all of a sudden has a big bonfire and he burns his tractors. You and I would look at him and say, what are you doing? Are you crazy? The only thing I can logically conclude is this. Why didn't he just sell them? But you see, in Elijah's case... Selling was not an option because those oxen represented more to him than that. This feast that was had was him saying goodbye to something. That's what this was. You see, because for him to burn his oxen was him getting rid of his tractor. And when it talks about the implements of the oxen, some of your translation will say that it was the cart or the plow. That he didn't just burn the oxen, he burned the plow. Now, I'm not a smart guy, but I know this much. That when a farmer burns his oxen and he burns his plow, that tells me that he's not going back to something. It's not like he just said, put it in the barn and we'll get to it when I come back. You see, if I were Elisha and I were thinking, hey, I'm going to follow Elijah for a time. Let me just go ahead and put the oxen in the barn and put the plow in the barn and I'll get some of my neighbors to take care of my animals. And you know what? I don't know. Maybe I'll go into the mission field for one year, two years, three years. 
but eventually I'll come back and I'll still have my lands and I'll still have my barns and I'll still have my oxen and I'll still have my plow so that I can pick right back up with where I left off. The only problem with that is Elisha didn't have an option to come back. Do you understand what took place with him? He burned his source of livelihood. He got rid of what he was going to uh, had the option to come back to. And so when Elisha left to minister to Elijah, do you understand there was no retreat? That's powerful today, church. That's powerful because that is an all-in mentality. That is, a, I have no other option. That is, a, I'm getting rid of all these other options. That is, a, if I come back and start over, I don't come back to the lush lifestyle that maybe I once lived. And I can only imagine he had 12 pair of oxen. He, in my mind, it's not like he's plowing with an old rundown donkey. I mean, he had to have some wealth. 12 pair? And he says, I'm burning the ships. That's what Elisha said. He said, I'm burning the ships. I'm not coming back. In other words, he said this, today is the last day of my old life. Tomorrow is the first day of my new. And I will not go back to my old. I wonder at times how many of us have followed after God, but we have not killed the oxen. I wonder how many of us have, have said we're going to follow God, but we've not burned the plows. I wonder how many of us have simply put the animals in the barn and left a way out. You see, I would propose this to you, that for those who want to follow God, that you cannot leave a way out. You must burn your retreat because God is not a God that says, follow me when it's convenient and leave me when it's not convenient. Because He knows your heart and He knows my heart and He's able to cut through and see who we really are. And so if we're only following Him in pretense, then what do you think that does to the one who's able to see what is truly going on in your life? There were individuals who would claim to have followed God, but he would say they were lukewarm in the book of Revelation. He would say those who, who claim to be on fire, but yet demonstrate a cold life. That is a mixture of hot and cold. You're lukewarm and I will spew you out of my mouth. What I learned from that is this. God has no time for halfway being on fire. God has no time for partly following Him. And that's why today I will tell you this. You want to know what it takes to burn the ships, you want to know what it takes to, to, to slaughter the oxen, to burn the plow, then it begins with this. You and I have been blessed with a gift. That gift is eternal life through Jesus Christ. But I need you to hear me say this. The gift that the Father has given is not greater than the Father. Some people struggle with that. Because in our minds, it's, well, eternal life is the best thing I could ever imagine. But I want you to think about this from a logical sense. If God is not greater than the gift of salvation, then He cannot give you the gift of salvation. He's got to be bigger than, this, than the gift that He gives you. And sometimes we forget that. We forget that the God we serve is bigger than the gift that He gives. And if you've ever forgotten that, then you're not alone. Abraham was called to sacrifice Isaac. And there were times that, that Abraham, he would, he would plea with God and he would, he would plea for a son and for God to follow through on his promise uh, of, a, of a child that would become his inheritance even at one point in time where Abraham would ask that Eleazar, would, uh, a servant in his house, would become the promise and, and ask that Ishmael would be the, the promise. And, and you look at all of that and you say Abraham was just getting frustrated that because God doesn't work on Abraham's time God works on God's time. And, and Abraham wasn't sure how God was going to follow through with the promise. The problem was he was trying to figure out God instead of just being faithful. Man, how many times has that happened to you? I know it happens to me a lot. And so there was a promised child. There was a promised child. God would promise and a fulfillment of that would occur. Genesis chapter 18 is just one of those number of places. Verses 10 and 11 says, He said, I will surely return to you. At this time next year, and behold, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Sarah was listening to the tent door. She was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age, and Sarah was past childbearing. But that didn't stop God. You understand today that God is not limited by your limitations. He's not limited by your time. He's not limited by your emotions. He's not limited by your flesh. 
He's not limited by your hunger. He's not limited by your need for sleep. Do you understand today that God is not limited by your sickness? That He is above all of that and He's demonstrated His power above all of that. So when it comes to understanding the gift of salvation, we need to understand this. That God is bigger than the gift of salvation. You think about a lesson that Abraham had to learn. And that was this, that sometimes, now in our situation, please understand, in our times God's not going to call you to give up your salvation to follow Him. But He will call you to give up many things to follow Him. God is bigger than the gift of your house. He's bigger than the gift of your car. He's bigger than the gift of your job. You see, many times we don't look at those things as a gift from God, but I will tell you this, that God blesses you with the health and the drive and the opportunities. And He expects you to glorify Him in all of those areas. But He may call you to sacrifice those areas. He'll never call you to give up His salvation. But I do want you to know this, He does call you to love Him more than your salvation. That's a deeper principle. I'm not sure somebody's ready to hear that today. Do you love God because He's God or do you only love God because of what He did for you? You see, that same thing would look this way. Do you love your spouse because they're your spouse or do you only love your spouse because of what they did for you? Mm. Okay, then let's do it this way. What happens when your spouse stops doing for you? Do you stop loving him or her? So what happens when God stops the blessings? Do you still love him? Or is it only conditionable, uh, conditioned upon what he does for you? That's a deeper biblical principle. Now here's the reality. God wants us to love Him because He's Him. Sometimes we need to remember that in order to get there, we've got to sacrifice the very gifts that He's given us. That's exactly where we're at in Genesis chapter 22. When Abraham takes Isaac up on the mountain and they prepare an altar and they prepare the wood and the, the Bible will say in verse 10, Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God since you've not withheld your son, your only son from me. I wonder what God is waiting on you to sacrifice on that altar. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's pride. I don't know if it's selfish ambition. I, I don't know if it's this. I, I, don't, I don't know if it's your understanding that as long as you're in control, that it's all going to be okay and God's just waiting on you to say, I can't control it anymore. See, sometimes, sometimes the closest you will ever become to God is when your life seems like it's spiraling out of control. Because at the point in time that you do not have the ability to have a handle on your situation, then and then, then and only then will you begin to look up and say, God, I can't do it, it's up to you. You know where most people find that position? Most people come to that position in their life in a hospital room. Most people come to that situation in life when their spouse or their mom or their dad or their child is on life support. You ever notice that before? Individuals who up to that point in time could control the finances. They could pay the bills. They could buy this. They could buy that. They could change schools. They could talk to the teachers. They could have control. But the one place they cannot have control is when it comes to the life or death situation of that child, that spouse, that mom, or that dad. And you know all of a sudden what happens then? They say, God, it's up to you. What if God's just waiting on you to say that to him in everyday life? Instead of thinking that you have all the control. Hmm. Let me tell you something, it's time that we begin to understand that the gift giver is bigger than the gifts that he's given you in your life. When you begin to cherish him for who he is and not simply what he does for you, I will tell you this, it will be easier for you to burn the ship of retreat in your world. Number two, I would offer this to you, that we need to understand that when we don't burn the ships, when we're not all in and all committed, that we miss great and tremendous blessings. I want to invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 19 this morning. Matthew chapter 19 is quite possibly one of the saddest accounts in all of the Bible. Because it's an account of a person who, who comes to Jesus. We know him as the rich young ruler. He comes to Jesus and, and, and he wants to know what, he, what else he needs to do. Look at verse 16 of, of Matthew chapter 19. And someone came to him and said, Teacher, 
What good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? And he said to him, Why are you asking me about what is good? There's only one who is good. But if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. Then he said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall uh, shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, verse 19. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. To which in verse 20, the young man said to him, All these things I have kept, what am I still lacking? Now this is why it's so sad. It's been said before that in all of the scripture, the rich young ruler, the rich young man, whatever your translation gives the indication that this is, he is quite possibly the most religious individual in all of the New Testament. I want you to think about that for one second. Jesus goes down the list. What good things shall I do? Why do you ask about what is good? This is what the commandments are. And he he, he spits back the commandments to this young man to which the young man says, all of these I have kept. We're not talking about a guy that didn't know his P's and Q's. He had dotted the I's and crossed the T's. He knew what Jesus was, was saying back to him because he said, I've kept all of these What am I still lacking? Some would say that the question was weighted almost in sarcasm. Some would say it was weighted in challenge. Some would say it was weighted in sincerity. I believe it's in sincerity. That's my conclusion. I don't believe he's challenging Jesus here. Because if that were the case, then why does he ask, what do I still lack? Jesus said, go sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor. Sell all your possessions and give the money to the... You don't understand, Jesus. I've not committed murder. I've not stolen. I've not committed adultery. I've honored my father and mother. He was a good kid. No indication here he was in trouble with the law. He wasn't a drug pusher nor a drug user. It doesn't give us any indication that he was out drinking on Friday nights or Saturday nights. Apparently his parents knew where he was and he wanted to honor them in all things. He was there on Sundays when the church door was open. He was listening and he was memorizing and he was taking into his life. And Jesus still says, you missed me. You you missed me? How how did I miss you, Jesus? what, What do I still lack? And Jesus says this. Listen to me. He says, I'm not your world yet. I'm I'm not everything to you yet. And because I'm not everything to you, I am nothing to you. You see, what's sad is this. Technically speaking, the rich young ruler had done nothing wrong. But I need you to hear this today. When it comes to following God... You can do nothing wrong and still do nothing right. Did you hear me? He had done nothing wrong according to what the law was that he was under. He had kept it all, but he still didn't do right. And the reason he didn't do right was because God didn't have his whole heart. That's what Jesus is getting at here. He said, you're a very wealthy individual and your wealth has drawn a dividing line between us. And and for some people it is wealth, but I will offer this to you. For some people it's poverty. For some people it's complacency. For some people it's occupation. You don't understand. You can do everything right. Uh, You can do nothing wrong, but also do nothing right. And that needs to be said today because I will offer this to you. Throughout the New Testament, I do not read that God saved you through His Son, Jesus, so that you and I could play it safe. He didn't save us to play it safe. He saved us to be all in. He saved us to be committed without reservation. And that commitment without reservation means that in every area of your life, that He comes first. Matthew chapter 25 speaks to what is commonly called the parable of the talents. And with this particular occasion, we learn there were some who who invested and some who made back, and they were blessed by the master when he returned. 
But then we also read of one who played it safe. And I will tell you this, if you hear nothing else upon this point, I will say this, you can miss out on the blessings of God if you play it safe. He did not call you to play it safe. Verses 24 and following, the Bible says, And the one also who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. And I was afraid and went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. You have what is yours. Now here's what you and I may think to that, right? You and I may think, well, at least he didn't lose. I mean, after all, it would have been bad if he would have lost. But he didn't lose. So why is it then that the master here, which you and I both know this occasion is God to those who he's entrusted with a purpose and a talent, uh, and, 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 and he says, I want to find it that you've, you've brought back interest. I want to find that you didn't just hold it to yourself. I want to find that it grew. And, and when I find that, it's because you trusted. You, you, you put forth, you put it to work, right? And the guy says, but I didn't lose. And the master still punished him. And I don't know if that blows your mind because some people are playing it safe in their walk with God. Some people up to this point in time in your life, your walk with God has been all about playing it safe. And there's a sense of comfort and a sense of complacency that comes with that and almost a sense of let me sit back and relish in the fact that I'm okay with God. Have you ever stopped to think for one moment that you're missing so many of the blessings of God because you're trying to play it safe? I would offer this to you. There's a stark contrast between the rich young ruler and the man over in Luke chapter 19 known as Zacchaeus. There's a stark contrast between the two. Because what we find is this, and in one occasion the rich young ruler... He goes away sad, quite possibly as the most religious individual in the New Testament. But he goes away sad because he's not ready to be all in. And then you turn over to Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19. And you find a man who, who wanted to see Jesus. He, he ran to see Jesus. He climbed up in a tree to see Jesus. And Jesus came by in verse 5 and he said, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. Verse 6 says, And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. And when they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Zacchaeus' reputation was not good amongst his people. Zacchaeus' reputation, like many tax collectors, was that he was an outcast, that he was a worker for the Romans, that he was not a friend of the Jews. And many of those tax collectors, they made their money by not just imposing the, the tax limit that the Romans said they had to, but they would inflate that for their own benefit. And the Romans said it was okay. But the problem is you're taking advantage of other people. And those other people said you're sinning in what you're doing. That's why they said they come to the house. He was a guest of the man who is a sinner. Well, they had that part right. Verse 8, Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor. And I've defrauded anyone of anything. I will give back four times as much. You think about, you think about what Zacchaeus said there. And I would offer this to you. And I know there's some, some scholarship that would, would read this account differently, but I want you to think about it uh, in this line. He said, I'll give back half of my possessions. And if I've defrauded anybody, I'll give back four times the amount of which I've defrauded. If Zacchaeus is in the same vein as many tax collectors, he's defrauded many people. I would offer this to you that at that point in time, Zacchaeus is not challenging God. He's not challenging the Lord saying, well, if you think I've defrauded anybody, I'll give back four times the amount. Nanny, nanny, nanny. It's not what he's saying. You know what Zacchaeus is saying? He's saying, I'll go broke if it means following you. That's what he's saying. I'll go broke. Indication is that he has had the money. He, he was a man of wealth is the indication. Most tax collectors did have more than the average citizen. He says, I'll go broke if it means following you. You know what the difference between the rich young ruler and Zacchaeus is? 
the rich young ruler went away sorrowful because he wasn't ready to burn the ship. Zacchaeus, he burned the ships and he said, I'm all in. I find it quite interesting when you look through the Bible and you begin to understand very quickly that you were not saved to play it safe and that the gift giver is bigger than the gift and that when you jump all in, only then will you fully know what it means to have the blessings of God. I find it interesting that many people will still back away and and think they can do this on their own. Some of you know who the writing of uh, the, the individual by the name of Sun Tzu. The book is a very old book. It's studied in our military academies entitled The Art of War. And in that particular book, Sun Tzu brings to light the logic behind the decision of history's greatest conquerors of burning their ships at the risk of being killed in the enemy hands. He would go on to explain it simply to eradicate any notion of retreat from the minds of their troops and to commit themselves unwaveringly to the cause of victory. You see, because when defeat, when defeat's on the table, you're going to get more out of the man. That's why I firmly believe that Nehemiah, when it came time to rebuild the wall, he stationed the men and the women and the children, according to the text, in their clans along the wall. Some of them had tools to fight, some of them had tools to work. But either case, he understood something, and that was this, that when the opposing force who had threatened to come and attack, when you are attacked, but you are standing there with your wife, or you are standing there with your children, and you understand real quick, if you fail to fight hard, that your wife would become somebody else's slave, or your children could be married off to somebody else, or your son could die, all of a sudden, that man in that hole of the wall, he fights stronger, he fights harder, because you know why? Because defeat is not an option. Just imagine, if God's people, if God's people engaged, in following Christ in the same way. Imagine if they were all in. Imagine if they had burned the the oxen and burned the plow. Imagine if they burned the ships. In other words, they said this, I have decided to follow Jesus and there is no way out. You know why people leave the Lord? It's because they've left the way out. What was read earlier came from Matthew chapter 16. And I read this again to you because this truly is an all or nothing mentality. That's why I say it's time for a fire. And maybe in your life that fire needs to be lit today so you to get rid of that ship. You get rid of that oxen, you get rid of that plow. Because it's possible in a number this size somebody's been holding back just in case following Jesus doesn't work. And it's time for you to get rid of your way of retreat. Because God's calling you to be all in. Matthew chapter 16 verses 24 and following. The Bible reads this way. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself most of the time and take up his cross sometimes and follow me when it's easy. For whoever wishes to save his life, by all means make sure that you don't go through any pain in this world. But if you lose your life here, you need to cry tears because God must have abandoned you. Does your text read that way, church? Mine doesn't either. So here's what I read. If you want to come after Jesus today, you must deny yourself. You must take up your cross. And you must follow Him. The idea is whoever wishes to save his life, he'll lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Now that doesn't make any sense to you and I. So here's what he's saying, okay? He's saying this. If you choose to save your life now, your life being the seat of your will, the seat of your desire, the seat of your decision, the seat of your ambition, your plans, that's your life, right? He's not talking about your physical. He's talking about what you intend to accomplish, what what your desires are, what your your ambition is. He says, if you you choose to pursue that, you will lose your life in eternity. But if you lose that now and make your life all about me, thus you deny self, take up the cross and follow me, 
then you will save your life. That's what he means. If you lose it, you'll save it. And if you save it, you'll lose it. That's what he means. And it's a call to be all in because the Bible says, verse 26, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Today, let me ask you a question. What are you giving in exchange for your soul? What, 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 what needs to be burned in your life? I, I don't know. Is it pride? Is it, is it, is it selfishness? Is it complacency? Is it a sense of if it's going to be, it's up to me and you've yet to understand that God is waiting on you to just surrender to Him? You know, believe it or not, at one time I was a lifeguard. Don't laugh, please. Okay? I was a lifeguard and I worked at a children's home. And in working for the children's home, they wanted somebody in the water who could wrestle the boys. It was a a home for children that had been taken away from their families because of behavior problems. And so they had to have somebody in the pool just in case these these boys decided they wanted to gang up and and cause problems with the staff. And so they looked at me and, and they said, Joe, we think you can do it. You've got to go through the lifeguard classes, which was quite funny because they sent me to the YMCA. And you got all these other, you know, fit people. And then you got me. And what was funny is when the lifeguard instructor found out what I was doing, she overlooked a lot of things. Almost as if we just had to pass him, right? I passed everything those other skinny people passed. I want you to know that. Proud of that today. But I actually, one time on this occasion, as a lifeguard at this pool, one of the young men that was in the home, he decided to act manly. Sometimes teenage boys get around each other and they, they get a little puffed up. Right, and they start acting too big for their pants. We call it too big for the britches, right? That's what that, They start acting like they're too big. He got out into the deep water because all the other guys were getting out into the deep water, but he couldn't swim. And so he got out there in the deep water. And I tell you this, you've never seen the whites of somebody's eyes unless they're concerned about whether they're going to breathe or not. I was up on my lifeguard stand, probably making fun of them. And I'd jump in. And they taught us to do this in lifeguard work. You had your little buoy thing, right? But they taught you in, in lifeguard training that you do not swim directly to somebody who is flailing around and drowning. Because that person who is drowning, they will do whatever it takes and push whoever under the water. It doesn't matter if it's their own mother. If they believe it will get them a breath of air. And so what you do is you swim up to the person. You tell them to stop flapping their arms. And then what you do is you push the buoy to them. Sometimes they're not in their right mind to even grab the buoy. So you know what you have to do. This is crazy. I know it is, but it, it is what it is, right? You actually have to wait until they give up. You look at that and say, that's crazy. No, it's not crazy. Because until they give up, you can't save them. Because they will hurt you and themselves. And so you have to let them surrender. You ever thought for one moment that God's just waiting on you to surrender? The Apostle Paul said, when I am weak, then I am strong. Not when I am strong, I am strong. God's waiting on you to surrender today. He's that lifeguard who, he swam out to you and he's just saying this, quit flapping your arms. Quit trying to save yourself. Quit trying to make this all about you. And how about this? When you just let go, then I'll save you. He's waiting to save you today. But in order to save you, it may take a fire. It may take you burning your way out. It may take your complete surrender. So today, I don't know where you are. But I know chances are someone in this room, you've been holding back on God. You've been flailing your arms thinking it's all about you. And I'm telling you, He's just waiting on you to surrender. So today, is that the day that you're going to surrender? Today is the day for you to burn your ships. Today is the day to burn the oxen and the plow. Today is the day to decide, am I all in or have I left a way of escape? God calls you to be all in today. And I promise you this, you will have the wonderful blessings of God in its fullest measure. But you've got to get out of his way. So today, if you're not a child of God, I invite you to become one. 
I invite you to confess Jesus as Lord, repent of your sins, and be baptized for the remission of your sins, to be clothed in the blood of Jesus, so that when God sees you, He sees His Son, and He will remember your sins no more. Today, many of us have already obeyed the gospel, but the question for you is this, have I left a way of retreat? And if you have, it's time for you to stop. It's time for you to surrender fully and let the great Redeemer save you for real. Today, if you're subject to the Lord's invitation, don't put it off. Don't put it off. I don't know why it is. We have, we have sermons and we have, have lessons, but when it comes to the invitation, what we do is we can't wait for the song to be over because we got to go eat. Y'all are only laughing because you know I hit a nerve. Because somebody's already thinking in your mind right now what you're going to do afterwards. Can I propose something to you? If you've already started to let your mind wonder, Satan is already winning the battle for you. Because we're going to sing a song and somebody's going to be thinking, I can't wait till it's over. And you're going to forget and you're going to take for granted that the invitation has been extended to you. Do not treat this invitation song like any other. I tell people that when I preach, I have a 100% response rate, David. That's not an arrogant thing. I say that to get your attention. Here's the deal. In the singing of this invitation song, every single one of us will respond. We will respond by either staying in our pew. And by that statement, we will either say one of two things. Either one, I am good with God and He is good with me. And I hope He sees it the same way you see it. Or number two, you will say this, I need to repent and rededicate and I can do it right here from this pew. Okay? That's one option. The other option is this, you'll just tune it out. That's an option you have. Or you'll do this, you'll come forward. And you'll say, you know what, I'm not perfect, I need help. And you know what we'll say? Did you really think that everybody in this room thought you were perfect? Did you really think God thought you were perfect? Because you're amongst a lot of imperfect people only made perfect by the blood of Jesus. Today somebody needs to respond. I don't know who it is. You didn't come here necessarily expecting it, but right now there's a stirring within you. And I'll tell you this, I believe the Holy Spirit works through the Word, no doubt about that. And so if there's a stirring because the Word was proclaimed to you, are you really going to quench the Spirit and tell the Spirit, no, quit working in my heart right now? When the Word of God is preached, the Bible says it does not come back empty. I wonder whose heart will receive what was said today and who will respond. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, meet me up front. I'll meet you halfway. The elders here want to meet you. They want to study with you. Your ministers want to pray with you. Whatever we can do to help you, we invite you to come forward as together we stand and as we sing.